السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Dear brothers and sisters everywhere Welcome to another live edition of Ask Kuda The phone number which is available for your reach today is beginning with air code 002 83. And the email address is ask at huda.tv or alternatively gardens at huda.tv. Barakallah fikum. Um, before I begin, I plead to you and I ask you, all brothers and sisters, to make very sincere dua for this ummah to recover and to get up from its sleep and to be united. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to spare and save the sacred blood which is spilled everywhere across the whole Muslim Ummah. There is only a few days left for Ramadan. And subhanAllah, many people um, expect also to have Ramadan while there is plenty of bloodshed in Syria. Innocent people are being killed day and night. In the past, we used to th say in tens, now in hundreds in hundreds and this barbaric regime is using chemical weapons now unfortunately most of us are sitting and watching uh, we need to make dua we need to support them financially we need to include them in every dua in every sajda in every qunut we need to make qunut in every salah in the five daily prayers qunut nawazil because this is a disaster have you forgotten about Burma? Or because of what we see on a daily basis, it has become a routine to see Muslims, men and women, children and elders being massacred brutal, brutally and killed with no mercy. SubhanAllah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on this ummah. May Allah have mercy in this ummah. But wallahi, by the end of the tunnel, there is a great light. There is a great light, insha'Allah Azza Jal. يريدون ليطفئوا نور الله بأفواههم والله متم نوره ولو كره الكافرون هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون They want to put out the light of Allah سبحانه وتعالى They want to bury this deen This is not something new This has been happening ever since Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam emerged to declare his prophethood to mankind and his message. The opposition started ever since beginning from his own people, from his own tribe. And yet, subhanAllah, a few years later, Islam prospered and the whole peninsula has become a Muslim soil to the extent that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala later on revealed that إِنَّمَا الْمُشْرِكُونَ نَجَسٌ فَلَا يَقْرَبُ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامَ بَعْدَ عَامِهِمْ هَذَا Afterward, after it was impossible for a Muslim to perform tawaf and say labbaik Allahumma labbaik or say la ilaha illa Allah and there was 360 idols around the Kaaba the time has come إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحَ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has come and people started entering into the deen in groups, big numbers. Then glorify the name of your Lord and praise Him. He is the one who accepts the repentance. These ayat are very great. At the time of need, we need to make istighfar. At the time of prosperity, we need to maintain the blessings by making istighfar. At the time of adversity, we need to make istighfar because perhaps our suffering is simply due to our sins, our mistakes, 
our shortcomings. فقلت استغفروا ربكم إنه كان غفارا يرسل السماء عليكم مدرارا ويمددكم بأموال وبنين واجعل لكم جنات واجعل لكم أنهارا ما لكم لا ترجون لله وقارا. There was one time where the ummah was going through a big time turmoil, the crusades and the crusaders. Salah al-Din is somebody who was a slave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emerged him in order to lead the ummah to success. He utterly defeated the crusaders by the leave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This guy was a righteous servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a great warrior. Subhanallah. History will never forget such a great man that he used to, he didn't have a house. His house was the back of his horse. He spent his life defending the deen. He did not rest for a single day. And whenever he would patrol uh, the army and check on them uh, at night, he would find some of them praying at night the night prayer, and some are making istighfar. He said, be him no, sir. Insha'Allah, we will be victorious because of them because of their prayers, because of their dua. And whenever others are in deep sleep, this is where we get defeated from. We have to be attentive to a very important fact, which is, وَمَنْ نَصْرُ إِلَّا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ Victory comes only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in order to obtain it, you have to fulfill the requirements of this victory. The requirement, is as the Prophet sallallahu said in the hadith, which is a sacred hadith. Allah the Almighty says, أنا أغنى الشركاء عن الشرك بي من أشرك بي شيئا تركته وشركه Allah is the richest of all. Whoever has any room in his heart for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not interested in this person. Doesn't want his deed, doesn't want his uh, practice or worship because his heart is occupied by somebody else even if it's just a small percentage Allah wants you all to be his Allah wants you to put your trust entirely in him yes you're utilizing the available means but you know that you fulfill this condition and you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you only believe in him then you'll be victorious subhanallah in Ghazwat Badj Muslims were only 314, with only two horses and a few swords here and there. And they utterly defeated the Meccans who came were, and they were boastful and they thought we're going to eliminate Muslims. The Meccans at this time, they three times outnumbered Muslims. Then in another battle right after the conquest of Mecca, the Battle of Hunayn, the Muslims army was about 12,000. The number was so huge. They were climbing up into a mountain and going through a narrow area between two mountains. So one who was on top was looking to the rear of the army and they saw an endless army. So they said, no way that today will be defeated. We've got enough number. Right away they were defeated because some of them put their trust in the number, in the quantity, in the means. And they forgot that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِئَةً كَثِيرَةً بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ How many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us examples that a minority defeated the majority by the leave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they were believers, because they put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So Allah recorded this incident and the great failure of Muslims whenever some of them predicted that Victory is guaranteed because we are a majority. We've been victorious in the conquest of Mecca, and yes, we can do it. He said, Wayawmahunainin Ajabatkum Kathratukum, Felam Tugni Ankum Shaya, Wadaka Talaikum al Ardu Bima Rahubat Thumma will lay to Mudbirin. The twelve thousand soldiers ran off. They fled the battlefield, and they left the Prophet Sallallahu all alone with only a handful of the companions around him. They all ran away. أعجبتكم كثرتكم You were very pleased with your number. You thought victory is guaranteed because yes, you can do it. You're very powerful and you outnumber your enemies. فلم تغني عنكم من الله شيئا. 
فلم تغني عنكم شيئا وضاقت عليكم الارض بما رحبت. It did not help you an art because we relied on that and you were missing the support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وضاقت عليكم الارض بما رحبت. The earth, the earth is very spacious but it has become very narrow. You didn't know where to go. This is basically because of a trap that the enemies Hawazan and Thaqif set up to the Muslims and they started shooting them with arrows when they were in this narrow area. So they retreated and they smashed each other and they ran away back and forth. And the Nabi asked Al-Abbas, his uncle, because he had a very loud voice to call on a specific type of people. He said, Ya Abbas, call say Ya Ahl al-Shajarah. يا أصحاب السمرة يا أصحاب البيعة كل on the people who give me the pledge of allegiance بيعة الرضوان this is during the treaty of الحديبية there were 1400 companions كل on these companions كل on الأنصار so a handful of the companions returned to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and with this very few number the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم recovered victory in order to prove that number does not matter if the person is missing the ultimate factor of success, gain and victory, which is putting your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hamna from the KSA, how are you? Alhamdulillah, fine. Go ahead. Go ahead, Hamna. Sheikh, I have three questions. Yeah. My first one is, I have few leftover fast from the previous Ramadan. Yeah. And because I've been told not to fast after the 15th of Shaaban, can I keep my leftover fast now? How many days? Sorry? How many days leftover? Three to four days. Go ahead and make them up soon before the beginning of the following Ramadan. Okay. Lest you will be required to give a fidya as well. Okay? Uh, thank you. Yeah. Next question, please. Second question is, uh, we learned that we can perform umrah and give sadaqah for the loved ones who passed away. And can we, can food be given instead? Like, can food be given as sadaqah to Jariya? Okay. Next question, please. Uh, my uh, third question, Sheikh, is uh, can women visit the uh, graveyard of the Qabristan? Qabristan, okay. Okay, thank you, Hamna, got it. Now, uh, as far as the hadith which states that whenever it is the middle of Ramadan, uh, of Sha'ban, we should cease fasting, this hadith is specifically for those who did not have the tradition or the habit of fasting, voluntary fasting before the middle of Sha'ban. Yani somebody was negligent of voluntary fasting throughout the year, then he heard the Shaykh was saying that the Prophet Sallallahu used to fast very often in Sha'ban and so on. Uh, what is today, the 23rd of Sha'ban? Okay, let me fast. No, thank you. It's over. It's over. Don't burden yourself. But a person who had the habit of fasting before the middle of Sha'ban, whether throughout the year or since the beginning of Sha'ban or since the Rajab, he may resume fasting even if you want to fast on every single day until a couple days before the beginning of Ramadan in order to break, to distinguish the nafl from the fard. Okay? In the sound hadith of Ummu Salama and also Ummu al-Mu'mineen, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with them and many a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ never fasted in any month more than that he observed fasting during the month of Sha'ban. I mean the voluntary fasting. To the extent that some of the companions used to think that he would fast the whole month. Of course, he never completed fasting on any month, the full month, other than the month of Ramadan. Again, in order to distinguish between the nafla and the fard, the voluntary and the obligatory. So now, your fasting isn't uh, voluntary fasting, this is a mandatory fasting. You have to make up the missed days before the beginning of the following Ramadan. Since you're capable to do it, hurry. You only have seven days or six days left, so do it as soon as possible. Fast, make up the three or the four days, 
have nothing to do with the restriction of fasting after the middle of Sha'ban because this is making up an obligatory fasting. Al Jumhur, the vast majority of the fuqaha based on the practice of the companions, are of the view that if anyone owed fasting from the previous Ramadan and did not do it without a concession or a valid excuse until the next Ramadan, then number one, he owes the same days that he has to make them up after Ramadan, of course, in addition to the fidya of feeding one miskeen per each day because of being negligent for fasting before the next Ramadan or making up the missed days before the next Ramadan. Thank you, Sister Hamna. Second question is, it is permissible to give, to perform Umrah and give its word to a deceased person. Similarly, it is permissible to give food, uh, money, or donations to the poor on behalf of somebody who died and you intend to give their word to this person. That is called sadaqa. But a sadaqa to jariya or the continuous charity is the one which lasts. So as long as it is lasting, its word and virtues are lasting. Yani, if I build a masjid, as long as the masjid is standing there and people pray there, every single time somebody is praying, I get a similar thawab of his or her prayer. There is a dars, there is a ta'aleem, there is a funeral prayer, there is a eid prayer, there is whatever. They feed the poor in Ramadan. Every good deed that is done on this spot, which I have built and established, I get a similar word of those who do it without diminishing the word of either one as long as the building is there. So if I die, I still get the benefit of this word after my death. 10, 20, 30 years, 100 years, 40 years, that's called continuous, as long as the benefit is continuous. Feeding the poor is a sadaqah, but it isn't continuous charity. Building an orphanage is a continuous charity. A hospital, continuous charity. Water fountain, continuous charity. These are all continuous charities because as long as they last and they continue to benefit others, you're also benefiting out of the reward. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Bintu um, Muhammad from Sheikh United Arab Emirates. Sheikh, my husband is uh, working for an Islamic bank. Nah. But uh, some people have told him that uh, no bank is completely Islamic. And uh, he too is a little uncomfortable. And wants no doubt about the risk that he's getting. Nah. So, and so he we decided to change the job. But for past six months we've been looking for something. Nah. But due to recession, Father Allah, we're not finding anything. No. So right now we were in a confusion whether to leave the job without having another one in hand or uh, to continue. Okay. And if you can advise me on that. Sure. And um, if my husband can speak to you later on from the, sometime. Sure. Barakallah fiki. Thank you. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these blessed days and war will approach in the month of Ramadan, make it easy for your husband to find a 100% lawful job. Um, the best person to answer your question is your husband, not me, because he's working in the bank. So when somebody says, yeah, Sheikh, there is a, an Islamic banking transaction or an Islamic bank here or there, I say, I'm not sure, I don't know. I have to find out whether it's truly Islamic or it is just by name. Whenever I was studying uh, in college at Al-Azhar, they opened um, one of these conventional banks in, in our campus, okay? It's known, it's a riba-based bank. Then they put a big sign that said, Islamic dealing branch. So I was very curious and I went, and I was pretty young, and I went to the uh, bank manager or whoever was in charge, I met him and said, you know what? I just have one concern. You guys are conventional banks. He said, yes. I said, you know that you deal with riba, right? So also when you say the branch of Islamic dealing, this is actually a confession that the rest of your branches are un-Islamic. He said, yeah, but let me tell you one thing. Whether Islamic or non-Islamic, by the end it is put in one pocket by the end of the day. We're just trying to suit you guys. Some people like to be fooled. Some people like to be given some hypnotics. 
that, okay, I'm taking your money and I'm investing it in an Islamic way. It isn't sufficient. I have to investigate. Like what? When, when the contract says that, okay, the conventional banks give you 10%, guaranteed. No losses, 10%. Oh, this is riba. This is interest, right? Usually. So the other bank should say, would give you 6%. So because you think it is lesser, these guys are righteous. No, they're wicked. They're wicked. The bank, brothers and sisters, and the Islamic transaction isn't only about the interest. There is a very important, very, very important information that I have to share with you, which is, whenever a bank says that we are an Islamic entity, they have a Sharia council, they decide which project should they go in and which project that they cannot support financially, they cannot sponsor. There is a party for this singer or ballet dancer and they wanted a fund from the bank. A conventional bank would be more than happy to sponsor it. An Islamic bank would look into any project, whether it's halal or haram, to support, to invest in. It is not only about the percentage and it's not only about the profit or whatever. So your husband was working in this bank and he's the best one, he's an insider uh, who can tell whether it's an Islamic or not and he can help us also by notifying us. Uh, keep looking if you are suspicious and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for you to find a lawful job as soon as possible. If you have enough fund and you're not very happy with your job, you have enough fund uh, to support you, go ahead and uh, resign. If you don't, you can keep looking serious and work with the limit. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Samira from United Arab Emirates. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, Sheikh. How are you, sister? Alhamdulillah, how are you doing, Sheikh? I'm fine, alhamdulillah, barakallah fi ki. Sheikh, inshallah, tomorrow I'll be leaving for Umrah. Ma so I have a question pertaining to it, please. Now. And if it would be nice if we can ask, answer them in today's show, please. Okay. Inshallah. The first question I want to ask you is about um, uh, the thing is, Sheikh, I suffer from polycystic ovaries. So n the thing is, and my, my menstrual cycle is very irregular from the beginning. So now that I'm married as well, Alhamdulillah. So now the thing is, I'm going for Umrah, but uh, it has been uh, now uh, 15 days since my, uh, my period has started. So now what should I do? Should I consider as istikhada and uh, inshallah make the niya for umrah and go tomorrow? How many or days was it back? normally, Sister Samir? So I'm in a, in, a, in a complete confusion state. Okay. Second is my Sheikh, are we allowed to put uh, like Dio or any perfume or any scent like uh, something that I'm of Ahram, which is where the Ahram? Okay. Barakallah. And the uh, third question is about um, the cutting of the hair, Sheikh. Like how, up to how much length, like for women especially? The, the hair should be trimmed off. Only these questions. Jazakallah khair. Okay. Thank you, Sister Samira. Wa jazakum. fiki. Sister Hamna visiting the Kabristan, the graveyard for women. There is a difference of opinion. And uh, I believe in the light of the hadith, which came later to abrogate previous ahadith in which the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I had forbidden you from visiting the graveyard. Now I'm commanding you to visit it because it will remind you of death. So in fact, that would benefit both men and women, provided when you go to the graveyard, you follow the proper adab and etiquette. You do not uh, scream or weep and do the acts of jahiliyyah and you should really go in the company of a mahram because this is a deserted or abandoned uh, area. And your purpose, your sole purpose of the visit is number one, to receive the admonition, and number two, to give salam to the grave. You are the willers, Muslims, men and women, to say the salam and avoid any sort of innovations. There are no particular ayat to be recited there. Just say salam. Assalamu alaikum, ahl al diari, min al mu'mineen, awal muslimin. وإن إن شاء الله بكم لاحقون نسأل الله لنا ولكم العافية. then you can pray for the dead person if you wish then you turn around and you leave. 
So this is simply visiting the graveyard and you contemplate the fact that soon as in the dua it says وَإِنَّ إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ لَاحِقُونَ Soon we will join you. Imagine yourself being in the pit, being in the grave and people would lock the doors behind you and they would leave you all alone. So that is the main purpose of allowing and recommending visiting the graveyard. After the Nabi Sallallahu established the Tawheed and people realized that the dead could not hear let alone, alone answering your dua because people used to go and invoke the dead or talk to them. So the fact that these guys are most in need for us for our dua, I mean. So it is the living who can make dua for the dead, not the other way around. We'll take a short break, inshallah. We'll be back to answer Sister Samira's questions. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. We have uh, Brother Kabir from Nigeria on the line. Brother Kabir, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. How are you, brother? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Kabir Ahmed from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, yeah, Sheikh, my question today is about uh, the status of rental income with regards to the cut, mm. the uh, annual rental income that somebody collects. Uh, what is its provision with regards to the cut, please? Thank okay. You. <coughs> Thank you. Brother Kabir Ahmed from Nigeria. Okay. Uh, Sister Samira, inshallah, is going for Umrah, and she has a serious issue that uh, the menses is continuous. Now it's over 15 days. As long as it was not like that before, so the excessive bleeding when the color and the odor has changed, that will be treated as istihada. Istihada is known as irregular bleeding. Uh, gynecologists and uh, doctors do not normally distinguish between haid or istihada, it's just bleeding, okay? But it makes a big difference in Islam because it will determine whether you can pray or not, uh, fast or not, and perform tawaf or not. Al istihada does not prevent a woman from offering all the acts of worship, only the menses, the monthly period. The irregular bleeding afterward is treated as istihada, where the woman would wash herself and perform tahara wudu prior to every prayer after the time has entered. So when you hear that, then you make wudu and you pray for each prayer. And also you can with the same wudu pray the relating nawafil before or after until the next fard, where you will be required to make a new wudu. The same applies to at-tawaf. The only pillar of Umrah which requires tahara is at-tawaf. Al-Umrah consists of three pillars. Ihram, which is the intention of commencing into the act of Umrah or Hajj, in your cases Umrah, and it will be announced by saying labbayka Umratan. And then you start avoiding all the restrictions of ihram, cutting the hair, removing the nails, uh, covering the face for a woman, uh, using any scented substances, wearing any makeup or perfume, etc. for men, uh, wearing covering the head, or wearing any stitched clothes, or wearing any perfume, in addition to whatever we mentioned in the case of women, removing any hair or nail, and obviously having an intimate relationship or the introduction to that. That, that is entirely restricted during Ihram. Then at tawaf is the second pillar in order which requires tahara. In your case, just simply make wudu and perform tawaf. 
because it's called istihada. If it is hayd, it is different. You have to wait. As in the hadith of Aisha, radiyallahu anha, when she performed hajj with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she performed hajj with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and when she entered Mecca, uh, he noticed that she was crying. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, hmm, I figured it out. You must have started your period. She said, naam, ya Rasulullah. He said, don't cry. It is something that happens to every woman. He didn't choose it. Do everything that the Hajj would do, except for tawaf. Wait until you're clean, perform ghusl, and do tawaf. So in your case, you're coming already with an irregular bleeding. Treat it as istihada, and perform your tawaf. And then the sa'i and your umrah is fine, insha'Allah azza jal. The period would not diminish your word of the umrah or the Hajj. Because this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you with. It is out of your control. Okay? Women who may start their period, the actual period, which would actually prevent them from performing tawaf, they must avoid performing tawaf unless. Nowadays with the expansion in the haram and the construction, I heard that the haram can only accommodate 22,000 at a time, every one hour. My God. I cannot really imagine how would this happen, but uh, Allah will deal with it. Allah will take care of his haram. When you expect three to four million people, last year about four million people performing hajj, and there is one day everybody wants to do tawaf. Then on the farewell tawaf, everybody wants to even do tawaf. How would this happen? Okay, so for a woman, I'm just using this as a reference. Later on we'll expand on this maybe in, a, in an independent episode to speak about the proper way to do it with this crowd. So the woman who must leave right now because she has to catch a flight, she has to join her company. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said because of the necessity, even with the menses, perform ghusl, wear your pad and perform tawaf because this is a necessity, even with the period. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Raja from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum, Alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, sister? Uh, sir, um, uh, I am currently uh, residing in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And due to the uh, legalities here, I wasn't able to go home for 10 years. Mm. I am uh, hoping to uh, visit my family, and unfortunately, it's going to be at the time of Ramadan. And I am the only Muslim in my family. Mm. Um, considering the fact that I don't want to displease Allah and I'm really confused, I, I want to know what am I supposed to do first so I can spend ample time with my family mm. without jeopardizing my uh, my uh, my fasting, sir. Nah. Okay. Well, Jazakallah. Thank mm. you very much for all of the guidance and help. That Thank you, you sister. May Allah bless you all, sir. Thank may you. Allah guide your family and uh, open their heart to accept Islam. And you can travel while fasting. You can break your fast if you're traveling. You have that concession. And it is with the choice. If you want to fast, you may. If you want to skip fasting while traveling, you have this concession. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَامٍ أُخْرَى آيَةٌ 184 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Let one of you who is either sick or on a journey to skip fasting if they want to. So you have the choice. If you can afford it. But when you reside in the place which you're visiting now, you must observe fasting because you become a resident. You're not traveling anymore, even with your non-Muslim family. So based on your uh, benefit risk ratio, you, you got to determine whether you like to travel in Ramadan uh, or not. Thank you, Sister Raja. Now, <coughs> uh, wearing perfume for women during ihram. I assume that you're asking about it is a sunnah for men before putting the ihram on and after taking the ghusl. The traditions of preparing for ihram to clip the nails and remove the unwanted hair, the pubic and the underarm hair. And then men would put perfume or musk against their bodies. Not the ihram clothes. The perfume shouldn't touch the ihram clothes. Again, is their bodies. Then afterward, you put your ihram on. Women shouldn't wear any fragrance. Why? Because it is not permissible for a woman to walk out with uh, perfume in any case, whether outside the Hajj or Umrah or in, in Umrah or Hajj, or actually let alone in Umrah and Hajj. Okay? 
Then after the tawaf is over, and after your umrah is over, you're hanging around. Wallahi, I see uh, some very strange practices. You bump into a woman, a sister in the elevator. She's wearing a full makeup. Hey, ma'am, where are you going to? Where do you think yourself going to? This is not a, a, a nightclub. You're going to the haram or walking around in the haram. The whole area is haram. Whom are you trying to please exactly? Whom are you trying to bring? Wallahi, I have seen women during the day of Arafah wearing makeup. I mean, full makeup. And taking pictures and so on. Educate yourself before going to the haram, before performing this act of worship, lest you may ruin it. Being ignorant isn't an excuse. Why? Because if you're traveling to Disneyland, you read the brochures, you know the itinerary, you know what you're going to be doing on every day of your trip, of your flight, even on a cruise. So why, why, why when you're going for Umrah or Hajj, you leave it up to the chance? I'll, I'll come to know. Somebody must uh, be there to tell us what to do. Not necessarily true. There is a program called Hajj Step by Step. And many programs by Huda TV about Hajj. It's available for free. Give yourself a chance to watch it in order to help you to perform proper Umrah or Hajj. Thank you. As far as at tahallul at tahallul is the act of exiting from the condition of ihram and removing the ihram. Al-ihram is a status, is not only an outfit. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Abu Talib from Sudan. Alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead, brother. How are you? Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? Mute your TV, Abu Talib, please. How are you, Sheikh? Abu Talib, mute your TV, please. Uh, yes. Uh, I ask for, uh, and I, from the meaning of this ayah, in Surah Yusuf, Muhammad Bihi wa Okay, I got the ayah, inshallah, I'll give you the tafsir. Thank you. Okay. Allah, Okay. Barakallahu I ask for the meaning of this ayah. Sure. I got it. Yes, thanks. Thank you, thank you. You're most welcome. Naam, thank you. So the ihram, as I said, is a status. It is not only the outfit. Yani, as a man, I can take my clothes off and put the ihram on, but I'm not in ihram. When I try the ihram on at home, when I wear it until I go to the airport and in the plane, that doesn't mean I'm a muhrim. I still can do any of the restrictions which I can do during ihram because I'm not in a state of ihram. Only when I'm wearing the ihram clothes, then I say and I declare the ihram by saying, labbayka Allahumma labbayk, labbayka umratan or labbayka hajjan. And then I commence into the act of ihram and now have to abide by the rules of ihram. Now, I've done my tawaf, I've done my sa'i, then I finish my umrah, and in hajj I've done my arafah, thrown the stones, and I'm ready to do tahallul, I've done. So I'm ready to do the tahallul, which is to exit from the condition of ihram. It can be observed by what is known as tahallul, to shave or trim the hair. Shaving is only for men. And men have the choice either to shave or to trim, but shaving is most preferable. As the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made three times dua for those who shave versus only once for those who trim. Okay, great. Now there is another thing which is for women. To trim the hair, the purpose is to remove just some of the hair. How? If the woman is putting her hair in braids so simply it will be by getting from the end of the braid like the length of a fingertip by the scissor can she do it by herself yes 100 percent another can do it for her mahram or a woman yes what about what we see that people gather at al marwa there is a barrel or a few barrels and people doing tahallul and a woman taking her scarf off in order to do tahallul it's a big time violation 
imagine, imagine number one, that a woman has to show her awra because the hair is awra, right in the middle of the haram. Number one. Number two, would you like to get a haircut in your kitchen? What about in your bedroom? On your bed, on your nice bed, or on the couch? No way. Why not? Because the hair will mess up the place. So how come you allow yourself to get a haircut in the haram? And people are standing in line. Show some respect. Love the place which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treats it as the most sacred place on earth. And when you see somebody doing so, say, bro, it's only a couple of steps. Step out and get a haircut. There are tons of uh, barber shops. You can go to your hotel room and you get a haircut there. Don't do it in the haram. So for women, it's only trimming, not shaving. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Amy from Egypt. Hello. How are you, can sister? You go ahead. I hear you. I'm fine, Sheikh. Alhamdulillah. Um, Sheikh, uh, my question is, my husband is is working outside the country. Mm. Now, the interval of uh, Maghrib and Isha is just uh, two hours. No. And the Sheikh, uh, the Imam of the Masjid there, they pray the Isha one hour before it's, it's a den. Mm. Now I told him, no, you have to, he, he has to pray alone and don't go there to that masjid because they cannot pray before the Adhan. No. Because uh, they are praying it in advance because the Fajr is 3 a.m. No. And the Isha is 11 a.m., mm. 11 p.m. No. So <laughs> the advice that I give is it correct or not. And then uh, there is this woman... He get, she gets pregnant, and she didn't fast the two years of Ramadan. Now, there is a woman who told her that uh, she just have to pay some money for charity, and that's it. I told her, no, you, you have to fast the, the years that you didn't fast. And I told the woman that don't say that because it's not right. So is this also correct? Both are correct, mashallah. You give a right fatwa, alhamdulillah. Barakallahu feeki. Uh, as far as the Aisha prayer, I'm fully aware of what you're talking about. There are some countries where Aisha is very late. Uh, there are two options. You pray on time, and this is the job of the Imam, and who cannot afford to come, pray at home on time. Or there is one fatwa pertaining the concession of combining the Isha with Maghrib, not an hour later and an hour before Isha, only when it becomes impossible to pray Isha on time, due to the fact that if Isha is at midnight or past midnight and Fajr two hours later, then they have to go to work two hours later, it becomes complicated. So uh, there is a concession in this regard. But for a person who does not have an excuse and he can afford to pray on time, then they should pray each prayer on its fixed time. There is nothing called that uh, I pray before the time because I'm busy or I want to sleep or I'm trying to catch something. The prayer before its fixed time is invalid. As far as the sister who skipped two Ramadans of fasting, you said that she was pregnant. So uh, maybe during pregnancy and then breastfeeding that she was not capable to fast, she only must make up the days which she skipped. Okay? Uh, those who require the fidya or feeding the miskin along with making up the fasting in case that she was negligent. The person did not make up the missed days of the previous Ramadan until the following Ramadan has entered without a valid excuse. But normally women who are pregnant then afterward, the breastfeeding and so on, it takes, uh, it takes a couple of years. Uh, Brother Kabir Ahmed from Nigeria, zakah on the rental property. Uh, the property itself um, is not zakatable or if it is properties, they're not zakatable. The rent which he collected throughout the year after spending on the maintenance and paying wages and so on, we look into the asset which of what you already 
maintained by the end of the lunar year, whenever it's due to pay the zakah, let's say that you, you're due to pay the zakah on the first of Ramadan, okay, how much money do you have, including the rent, which you already earned and received, your salaries, your positions, your investment here and there, everything should be added up and you pay the zakah on the total sum. Uh, what about a rent which is due after the due date of the zakah? I'm not supposed to pay zakah on it. The zakah is on it you already received. Or it was due and the guy said, I'm just broke, but I will pay you in a few days because it's already yours. You have already possessed it before the due date of the zakah. Again, please, I recommend you to check out our program of fiqh of zakah. Fiqh of zakah deals in details with the different masail of the zakah which concerns every Muslim. By the end of this uh, program, brothers and sisters, again, I beg you to include your Muslim ummah in your dua in these blessed days, especially at the time of iftar, for those who still fast during the month of Sha'ban, include them in your dua. Uh, Egypt too is on the brink of a civil war. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect it. And it is very terrible. It is very, very terrible. Big time fitna. So dua would help a great deal. Please, I beg you, pray for the whole Ummah, Burma, Syria, Egypt, Afghanistan, Iraq, and obviously Palestine, which we forgot a great deal about our brothers who are under siege in Gaza. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for everybody. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Let me to pass the